Welcome to the All for Literacy podcast, hosted by Dr. Liz Brooke, welcoming established and emerging voices in literacy education and the science of reading. Explore with us the connections between literacy research, educators' knowledge and skills, and the implementation into classroom instruction. We are coming together to connect new and established research with the educators who apply those ideas daily in their schools and classrooms. And as we work to improve the effective literacy education in this country, it's essential that we have that conversation going both ways, from researchers to the classroom practitioners and from the classroom practitioners back to the researchers. Today, join Dr. Liz Brook in a discussion about the challenges facing educators as they seek to implement evidence-based literacy education, support classroom teachers, and serve the diverse needs of their learning communities. Here's your host, Dr. Liz Brook. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today on the All for Literacy podcast. Today, we're actually wrapping up All for Literacy second season, hard to believe. We're going to highlight some um, themes and quotes from our guests this season um, and tie it back to themes we're hearing even beyond the podcast. So as we work to continue to provide evidence-based literacy instruction to all students, we know that these efforts start with people dedicating their professional life to the education of our nation's children, the implementation of resources and tools based in the science of reading, presents a number of challenges, but also opportunities for educators. And it's important to start with this point. As Maya Angelou says, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And I think about myself with this quote a lot and the guilt I felt when I learned about the science of reading, realizing that as a first grade teacher, I didn't have the knowledge I needed to have the complete knowledge to teach the students to read in the most effective way. I understand that it's really challenging when you think about that and you have that realization. And I used to think about, oh my gosh, we need to get to these colleges and universities. Why aren't they teaching us um, about the science of reading? But the more and more we talk about this with more educators and, and lots of folks across the country, the more I'm realizing those professors were in a similar situation, right? They were just teaching what they had been taught. So it's this ongoing cycle, which is why it's so empowering to think about. We're not trying to blame anyone. We're just trying to understand. And when we learn more and know more, we can do better right? In that doing better starts with engaging educators at every level, ensuring they are equipped with the knowledge and understanding they need. So our very first episode was with Dr. Sharon Vaughn and Dr. Jeannie Wanzik around adolescent literacy. And this has been a fabulous conversation. So much attention has been paid to elementary um, and now more and more folks are saying, what about our secondary teachers, right? They need to understand about the science of reading because even if they're teaching science or social studies or math, guess what? That's taught through reading. I think the statistic is about 85% of our curriculum is taught through reading. So I'm going to read this quote um, from Sharon, Dr. Sharon Vaughn. And it really was the first time I had thought about it, but the the way she phrased it was so powerful. So I'm going to read this quote from her, and then we'll, we can come back and, and talk about it. But she said, I also think as students get older, we need to really think a lot more about how it is that we refine and define what all classroom teachers do to raise the literacy level. So rather than thinking, oh my gosh, what does the 40 or 45 minute intervention each day look like? Instead, what does every social studies class, science, English language arts, mathematics teacher 
need to do every day so that literacy enhancements are built into this content learning. And I think we know some things about that, she said, um, and we can do better about that. But I think as long as we sort of lean solely into intervention, these continue to be her words, solely into intervention, solving the problem, and not enough into the combination of classrooms, if you will, content area classrooms, practices, plus intervention, solving the problem, I think we are going to see and make inadequate progress. So that was a lot. Um, to share. So I want to break that apart a little bit. The first thing, and again, I've always thought about, you know, one of the biggest challenges we hear from educators in the secondary space is we don't have enough time in the day. We know these students are far behind um, grade level, and it's going to take some intensity in order for them to respond, right? So she said so clearly we need to shift our focus and not think about just reading intervention time, but it's literally throughout their day. And how do we weave these strategies into math, science, social studies, right? And until we embrace that combination versus solely putting all the onus on the intervention block, we're not going to see uh, the progress that we would hope. And then sometimes teachers might give up and say it's not working, right? Because they're not seeing that adequate progress. So I thought that was such a fascinating lens to help us all shift our thinking, especially in middle school and high school, that we are all reading teachers. And we're not saying to abandon your um, content, right? Your math or your science. But on that episode, we talked about a little bit more about what are some of those strategies you can introduce for five or 10 minutes, right? Doing some explicit vocabulary instruction on words that might be really um, impactful in their learning about photosynthesis, say, perhaps, or doing some more um, scaffolded text reading in the class or oral discussion about it, right? Listening comprehension, conversations with peers. So I encourage you if you haven't listened to it, and certainly if you're a middle school or high school teacher, but also district folks that our adolescent teachers need similar support in the science of reading and some strategies of how they can infuse that work throughout the student's day, right? And another big thing they focused on um, is thinking about also not only the, the reading components, but paying attention to mindset and um, executive function and things like that. So it's really a comprehensive approach that we need to be taking with our adolescent students. So it's, it was a powerful um, kickoff to season two. Another uh, really powerful session we had was with um, Dina Mortensen, who since she's been on our podcast, finished her doctorate. So Dr. Dina Mortensen, congratulations. She's the elementary reading and language arts supervisor from Waterbury Public Schools in Connecticut. She's featured in the movie Hopeville um, by Harvey Hubble. Uh, Harvey Hubble. Um, and she was talking about the importance of the science of reading and trying to roll that out district wide. And one of the pieces we talked about, which is so critical, was assessment. And she talked about how she really weeded out most of the assessments that were being given in the district because she had this really powerful quote that she said, I am of the belief that we, if we are going to take instructional time, again, we're talking about assessment, it needs to be quick, it needs to be easy, it needs to be accessible, and most importantly, it has to drive instruction. So when you're thinking about implementation and you often think about the curriculum or the professional learning, 
one of the things that Dina and I talked about was the importance of assessment and making sure I always give this tip that helps me think about reducing redundancy is make sure you know what question you're going to answer with the data from that test. So if you don't know what question you're trying to answer, don't give the test. <laughs> make sure you figure that out before you take, as Dina was saying, if we're going to take instructional time away, we need to make sure that the data is going to help drive that instruction. And on our episode with Dr. Young Suk Kim, we talked about the connection between reading and writing. And she talks all about her model, which is called the direct and indirect effect model of writing, and also had us do an interesting exercise to help us experience what we felt or what our students are feeling during the earliest stages of writing. And she shared that at one point, the science of reading, which makes sense, right? There was more evidence on reading studies, but in a recent review, that focused on studies on writing specifically, that those had increased significantly and are catching up to the reading specific studies. And the model that we review, again, I highly recommend you downloading that model as you listen in, but Young talks about the idea of multitude of skills, not just one component as they build towards reading comprehension and writing composition. So let's take a listen to this quote by Dr. Young Suk Kim from the episode. Uh, first, when it comes to teaching reading and writing, um, because reading and writing are built on multitude of skills, so instructional approach that emphasizes one aspect or one cluster of skills would not support overall development of reading and writing skills. So I just want to emphasize that instruction should address multiple skills comprehensively. Um, so if you look at the pillars, how I go by is the pillars. So the lexical literacy pillar and the oral discourse pillars, they have to be developing at the same time. Typically in you know primary grades, a lot of attention may be devoted to the lexical literacy, like of developing word reading and spelling. That's necessary, but that's not a sufficient in the long term because lexical literacy, as we know, is necessary, right? So word reading is necessary for reading comprehension. Spelling and handwriting or keyboard influence is necessary for writing. But as we know very well, that's necessary, but not sufficient for, you know, uh, good reading comprehension or written comprehension, right? So at the same time, as we are supporting students to develop uh, lexical literacy skills, we also need to provide very systematic and explicit instruction to support oral discourse skills. Again, that includes listening to stories, listening to informational text or uh, producing narratives or producing, um, you know, expository informational text in a very coherent way, right? To support that, uh, we need to teach uh, making inferences. We need to teach understanding different perspectives, right? How to reason and to teach vocabulary, sentence structure. So a common theme we heard, not just in Dr. Young Suk Kim's episode, but across our episodes is that science of reading is not just phonics or not just one thing, but the importance of teaching a multitude of skills and connecting those in really important ways. And then the idea that these skills are building not only towards reading comprehension, but about written composition and how often someone can become a fluent reader, but can still develop and need honing of their writing skills. Like when I think about myself, when I got to college and all the writing we had to do there, you know, you think, okay, I'm a fluent reader, but my writing skills are still developing even at the later stages of education. So a really powerful episode there with Dr. Young Suk Kim on connecting writing to reading in those foundational skills. 
We then spoke with Dr. Gretchen Givens Generet on the importance of equity focused school leadership. And she shared some insights from her work, including her book called Five Practices for Equity Focused School Leadership. And she tells us her powerful story and journey into education, how we start every episode, and she really talked about how her own experience in education helped shape her future work. And she talks about the book really starting with stories. So let's take a listen to a clip from that episode with Dr. Generet. And so what I hope this book is does for people is it helps them through very challenging moments that are, you know, complicated, right, and hard, that are exacerbated by the realities of power and privilege, you know, where we all have these different lives and experiences, but where we can model how we want to be with each other and how we want to show up for each other. Um, mm. I think this happens, right, that this is able to happen because a key feature of the store of the book is the use of stories, right? So we scaffold mm -hmm. stories in this book and we start with our stories and we do the stories of our schools and the stories of communities and the stories we tell and all those things. So I feel like the book really employs our collective understanding that embedded within stories is the unique opportunity to reclaim and reimagine how things might be if we can use stories as the beginning of our own self-reflection and growth and as a way to listen to and lean in to the development of others. So, And she taught me that once we know someone through knowing their story, we can never not see them. Such a powerful concept to keep in mind as we focus on not only the skills of teaching reading and leadership in the schools, but we also need to focus on the people and the leadership and what their story, how their story influences them and what they're bringing to the school leadership team. So again, a really powerful tool. Her book is more a, a workbook, if you will, taking the listeners through those um, five practices for equity focused school leadership. So another really powerful episode from season two. And towards the end of the season, we spoke with um, Natalie Wexler, who is the author of The Knowledge Gap. And she was talking about, again, we've been so focused on it's not just phonics, but it's all these other skills as well. And she brought our attention to a really important concept as well, which is building knowledge through listening comprehension or oral comprehension, because we know that a person may be developing their reading proficiency and they may have really rich language, but they are struggling with the code, right? So they're struggling to decode, which is the profile really of a classic student with dyslexia. Right? So they have this rich language, but they can't access it through reading, but they can access it through oral comprehension. And she talks a lot about how more and more there's curriculums that focus specifically on this building knowledge through listening comprehension. And this quote that we're going to share from that episode talks about what her experience has been across the country in terms of teachers who are starting to use this type of curriculum. So let's take a listen to that. And I, what I hear over and over again is, I, I never thought my kids could do these things. These kids are doing things far beyond what I expected. So I think we have been underestimating what young children um, and sometimes older children can do if you give them the raw material and the guidance and practice they need to reach their full potential. So it's very encouraging. I mean, there are certain parts of the country that are doing this more than others, but it's, it's spreading. It used to be, you know, first it was Louisiana, then it was Tennessee, and then I seem to be going to Texas every week, and now it's like Indiana and Ohio, but <laughs> also the Northeast. And, you know, it's, it, I think in, it's not totally organic because some of this is coming 
from above and, and lists of curricula that uh, districts and schools are, you know, encouraged or even maybe required sometimes to adopt or to choose from. Um, but I do think it's also growing organically as, as word spreads. And so again, as we think about all of these things we've covered in season two, we talked about writing and the connection to reading. We talked about adolescent literacy and making sure that even our teachers in science and social studies understand the influence of reading across the content. We talked about equity in leadership. Uh, we talked about social media and how you need to guard against um, making sure that what you're finding on social media is aligned to the science of reading and the evidence, right? There is a lot of stuff out there. You need to make sure the source of the information is really powerful. And then closing out the season with this episode around the importance of building knowledge and thinking about how background knowledge and vocabulary can be built through listening comprehension, as well as doing it through the reading comprehension process. So I really want to thank our listeners for joining us in this space to learn and explore these literacy issues. Season two has brought conversations with researchers, administrators, teachers. We've held our first session actually was at Plain Talk in 2024. And I really enjoyed being able to have these conversations with you in person. Join the conversation about literacy education on social media that are at the links in the podcast description. And I thank you again for joining us and we'll see you in the next episode.